Welcome to the second part of, of the fifth lecture on clean room operations. We're talking about manufacturing now. And the general machining process is a, is a set of six steps. Uh, the first is when we talk about the substrate or the base upon which you're doing your working. Whenever you're making small devices, you need to have something to hold on to them, and this is typically served by having a base. Uh, the first process is to actually form the base, that the substrate, which is cleaned. And then you perform some sort of operation to actually do something to the surface, such that it can be uh, um, processed for later operations. And then we call that treating, for lack of a better term, in the step three. And then fourth, we differentiate uh, the characteristics of the surface somehow. And make, so what the idea is, is that we're going to make some of the parts of the object, the surface, different than the rest. And then we'll rinse and repeat. We'll rinse that off, and those the objects that are different than the rest of it, um, perhaps we need to do some more work with those particular objects. And so we'll clean, treat, and differentiate yet again, and perhaps put on new structures and do it all over again several times. Okay, and the last step is to integrate. Very often, whenever you're making a device, it's, that it is very small. You need to protect it from the normal environments because you cannot just leave it in a clean room. You have to go out and actually use it in the real world. So you need to be integrated. And all that really means is, is that you encapsulate it in a, in a box or something that protects it from the real world environment, that 10 million, class 10 million environment with all the dust and damage that might happen. The base, or the substrate, is just a surface to work on and has purity um, and chemical and electromagnetic, optical, and other useful characteristics that you're looking for in, in the devices that you're making on it. Um, for example, this is a single piece of silicon. And this is produced by via the CZ or the Shirolsky process. And the idea is, is that we have a single crystal up here at the very top and we have a small line that holds onto that crystal. And it's drawn up. This small crystal is drawn from a, a bath, a liquid bath. And that liquid bath, a silicon, actually forms a crystal. And over time, it extends out, and we have this much. And slowly but surely, and as, we, and as we're pulling this out, we slowly rotate it to make sure it's nice and, and single crystal in form. And atom by atom, it slowly grows. And so if you look inside the structure, this is actually 300 millimeters in diameter, which is huge. But the idea is that we slowly pull this out, and throughout this entire structure, minus just a few imperfections under the growth area here, this entire structure is a single crystal. There is not a single flaw in this entire structure. So when you talk about purity, this is to within 99.9999% a single crystal. There will be an occasional atom here that will be a different atom, an iodium or something, but mostly it's silicon. Every once in a while, they'll have, have a substrate that's polycrystalline, uh, alumina, AL203, an amorphous material like glass, or even metallic materials, which are sort of between amorphous and polycrystalline. But very often, you talk about using single crystal materials. All the CPU chips and so forth are all made using silicon. Okay, this is another single crystal material. This is lithium niobate, it's piezoelectric, and this is so-called uh, typical lithium niobate. You can have what are called reduced lithium niobate where it's been uh, in a reducing environment and it causes it to turn brown. But lithium niobate is typically clear. The, the dark regions around here around the edge are, and down along the edge are actually impurities in this particular material. There's lithium impurities uh, where the lithium comes out of solid solution. Um, just from what I'm saying here, it tells you that you know when you're doing this, you have to know some things about material science that are necessary for you to be able to work in this field. And the the issue here is is that what you do is you actually slice out wafers, and here's some of the wafers shown at the at left. When you polish them completely down, they're crystal clear, just like glass. So this is showing the, the substrate. This is a solid bar of silicon at left, and you use a diamond saw to cut them out. And when you cut them out with a diamond saw, they're actually very rough, and then you use a, a lapping machine to polish them down to roughly 10 nanometers roughness and mirror, mirror finish, essentially. And these wafers are, as I said, cut by a diamond saw and polished. 
and the wafers are used to support the subsequent steps. And you can use metal, ceramic, or polymer substrates. These six papers down here are six different good papers uh, from 1992 out to about 2005 that talk about different methods to, to construct these substrates. Once the, you've got your wafers, you have to clean them. If you're using a diamond saw cutting, one of the big constituents in diamond saw cutters are, of course, diamonds in a slurry of oil. And so you have not only these hard particles laying all over the surface, but you also have oil that's all over the surface. You have to get rid of all that stuff. And then also, if you have any contaminants on the surface, you've got to get rid of that, too. So the next step is cleaning. And so the kind of cleaning depends on the process that would be used to manufacture something from it later. Some processes, all they require is just an acetone to rinse out the, the oil, alcohol to get rid of the acetone, okay, and a DI water to get rid of the alcohol. And when I say alcohol, I mean uh, wood alcohol or the kind of alcohol you would have, say, in a bottle of whiskey. And then dry nitrogen gas to get rid of the water. You'll notice that this typical of cleaning processes, if you use something to clean something else off with, then you have to turn around and use something else to clean it off with. So dry nitrogen is to clean water, water is to clean alcohol, alcohol is to clean acetone, and at the end you're finally done. If you're unlucky, then you have to do a little better on your cleaning. You have to use what's called a piranha process. If you have uh, particularly stubborn stains on the surface, the piranha is a combination of a base and an acid etch and it works at high temp at relatively high temperature, about 80 C, and it only lasts for a little while, and it's rather dangerous material, really. And then the last step, if it's necessary, is a plasma etch. This is a, a plasma that's induced by very high voltages from one region to another in a vacuum, and you can also put in gases in here that will ionize to actually bounce off the surface and cause this glowing to occur, which uh, the bouncing off the surface actually uh, knocks contaminants off the surface and also uh, knocks part of the atomic structure off the surfaces as well. So you end up with a sort of roughened surface that sometimes is ideal for later processing. This, the process of cleaning is critically important. It's probably the most important process in any of this. Some of the other processes that are shown here, this is a wet, uh, wet etching station where you actually clean, clean the wafers off in a wet process. This is a spin cleaner where it actually spins away for very high speeds and you pour chemicals down on it to spin it out. And this is an HF station where you put wafers vertically into hydrofluoric acid and clean those structures off with a rather dangerous acid, really. Here's a typical process for cleaning. A standard degrease, for example, two to five um, minutes soak in acetone with ultrasonic agitation. All that means that you have ultrasound that's roughly one megahertz, typically that's exciting the fluid so that it, it, it helps the, the process. Two to five minutes soak in methanol with ultrasonic ag agitation. The methanol gets at things that acetone doesn't, and these both act as solvents. And then two to five minutes soak in, in deionized. All that means is, is all the ions are removed from the water. And this is actually non-conductive water. You can put a very high voltage through it, and it's non-conductive. If you have any ions in there, then they actually will, could, could conceivably contaminate the surface again. So that's the reason why the DI is important. Sometimes it's called, at least in Australia, it's called millipore water because of the company that makes filters for DI water in this country. And then you use 30-second REN cells or free-flowing DI water, just in case you have something contaminated if you're in your ultrasonic cleaner. And then you spin, rinse dry for wafers or blow off uh, dry from, for tools and chucks with uh, dry nitrogen. If you have something, if you have worse problems, you can use uh, cancer causing 111 trichloroethylene or TCA or trichloroethylene with ultrasonic agitation. And these kinds of things is all associated with, with know how. that's not really written down anywhere in a, in a book. You can ask people that know that have worked in clean rooms. But the problem of it is, is that writing down all these processes is impossible because it's specific to the particular process that you're setting up. Sometimes this can take a long time to do, six months or more, uh, to actually get your process correct. And then once you have it going, you can actually continue with your work. Once you get done with that stage, then you talk, have to talk about treating it. Um, you can oxidize or reduce the surface or in the entire wafer. 
Uh, for example, uh, you can you can create a layer of silicon dioxide and a silicon wafer that's common nowadays for memory chips. And for example, you can have through the thickness of a wafer, you can have a thin silicon dioxide layer in this silicon wafer. And when you start cutting and making features in this structure, you cut away this part here and this part here. And it, this acts as a natural stock for that process to happen. And then when you come back later, you can etch all this away. And you have removed the entire lower surface. And so this actually releases. And you're left with just the upper part left over. So it's a strategy to help you make certain structures. Lithium niobate can be reduced for reduced power electric effects so that it won't electrocute you whenever you, you heat it up and cool it down uh, during the processing steps. You can coat the surface of the wafer with metal through spider electro deposit techniques or uh, thermal vapor dep deposition techniques. You can put polymers on with a spin coat process. This is a, a very small wafer that's been spun at high speed. And you see this red material, well, that's photo resist that's sensitive to ultraviolet radiation and will be used later on. Um, you can also dip coat the structures. And this is a wafer being dip coated into a fluid. And it's very much like spin coating, although dip coating tends to be more rarely used. This is a good reference for this. This is a spin coater. We have a spin coater like this in the lab. And we have a much more expensive spin coater as well in the lab system now. If uh, it's not unusual to be given information on spin coat curves, so for example, we use this chemical TOS MTES, for, for instance, and we, we spin it at 1,000 RPM, we get a certain spin curve we get a certain thickness of the film, so a 6 micron thickness if we spin it at 1,000 RPM and use a molecular ratio, uh, molar ratio of ethanol to TLS MTES of around 1. And if we spin it at 1,500 RPM, we get uh, 5 micron thickness. The difference between these two can be quite significant. Then once we have the, the surface defined, then we need to differentiate. You can use traditional machining, and these are some examples of traditional machining techniques. This is a, a, a piezoelectric motor um, of mine, and I actually made this, this center component by hand back in uh, 2002 um, using a hand file and a diamond file and then a drill press and then some to actually um, I drilled some holes here and then tapped the holes for threads, tapped the hole here for some threads. And, uh, and these are linear bearings that I purchased. And then I, I made this structure as well by hand. This is all traditional machining processes. Then there's another process called chemical etching that you can use. This is etched titanium. This is a titanium plate. And it's been etched in a two-step process where it's been etched through, all the way through to the other side. This came from a, just a single solid plate. And then it's been hatched, ha etched halfway through. And what this is, this is actually a heat transfer module. So if you have a, a fluid in here, it flows back and forth, and it helps cool the structure on the opposite side of it. And there's some other parts of examples in here as well. This is uh, actually a, an old impact printer head. And this is a, an electronic shield made out of brass. And there's a bunch of through holes in here. They're cut. If you had to use a drill press to do this, it, it would take you years, and then probably you'd break so many drill bits you'd give up. But with the chemical etching processes that are used, you can make uh, thousands of these for very, in very inexpensive prices. You can also use laser radiation, or you can use other pr approaches. Um, you can irradiate um, using laser radiation from a single point, or a flood, just expose the entire surface with a mask. And the mass shields part of the structure from illumination by the laser, and therefore it keeps it from being cut. And this is an example of such a structure. This was cut using a mask. There's an X-shaped hole in the mask. And the laser light was turned on over a larger region. And then when it was turned on, it burned away whatever the mask didn't show. And all that was left was this, this X-shaped hole, and the, light was shut off, and the light was shut off. And then you can also use... Um, flood without a mask or a pinpoint structure. And for example, this pattern was cut out using a laser that was told to, to go around in this gear shape pattern. And then it was told to shine on this, these regions, welding the, 
this pin to this round structure here. There's two different kinds of metals. And there are different kinds of lasers you can use. You can use carbon dioxide lasers for this, ND YAG lasers. ND YAG is an infrared laser, but uh, it can be a very high power, uh, kilowatt order. You can use xenon fluoride excimer lasers. And actually, we have one in, in the MNR lab from machining structures using xenon fluoride. And this is UV. And it's correctly called an exiplex laser, although many people call them excimers. And it cuts via bond breakage. There's also Avia 266 uh, nanometer uh, lasers, 355 and 532. We have access to a 266 laser, which really will cut almost anything. Another approach is to, to use lithography, where you use ultraviolet radiation, like shown here, and shown through an optical system. And you have a mass that has a pattern on it. And they maybe use a polymer material that's sensitive to this radiation. And the mass blocks part of the radiation in such a way that the part of the photoresist is sensitized and part of it is not. This is perhaps a better view. We have maybe silicon and silicon dioxide, and then a resist on top here. And we have ultraviolet radiation that's coming in from the top on this laser sample. Laser sample. And we have a matte clear piece of quartz with the stainless steel pattern on that there. Wherever the stainless steel is at, it blocks out the ultraviolet radiation. And if it's a negative tone resist, then whatever is exposed to the light uh, will remain stuck on the surface. So there is cross-linking that occurs in the polymer. And wherever it hasn't been exposed, there's no cross-linking. So when you when you later etch it, it actually cuts out here and leaves it behind. So it's a so-called negative resist because the pattern is opposite the original pattern on the mask. You can also have positive resist that, that remain cross-linked until they're exposed to this ultraviolet radiation. And when it's exposed to ultraviolet radiation, the cross-links are broken. And when you etch away, this, this, this is destroyed. So it's a positive resist because it looks exactly like the mask. And once you've done that, then you can clean the wafer or just clean the areas exposed to radiation or clean the areas not exposed to radiation and then prepare for treatment and do it all over again. And if you've done all this enough, if you've made your five layers, say, for the dynamic light uh, device, for example, from uh, the Texas Instruments device with the mirrors, then you can go on to integration to actually contain the structure. And just having a micro nano device, the point here is, is that just having one of these devices it is, is nice, but it's not enough because the only place you could ever really use it is in a clean room, and it probably wouldn't work for long anyway. So you have to have external connections of some sort, electromagnetic, optical, structural, fluid, thermal, chemical, quantum, and so forth. And then you also, more importantly probably, you have to protect it somehow from the environment that it's going to be used in. And, for example, inside of here there's an accelerometer. It's a small... A silicon chip with a small proof mass on it, and when you move this chip, the, the thing oscillates back and forth, and it's protected by a black box. That's why when you take a computer apart, all you see are little black boxes with legs, because in, inside that black box is a silicon wafer that's been glued in there, and wires have been bonded back and forth between these legs and the connections on the chip itself. And LED is another good example, because we've all seen them. The actual the working device is really, really a very small part of the structure. 90% of it is the packaging. The device itself is just really the material and the electrodes that are, that are attached to this structure. You have one electrode that goes around on the top of this LED structure, and then you have one that goes around the bottom with this focusing cap on the base of it. The rest of it is this polymer potting material. actually just protects protects it and then serves to focus the, the light out at one end. Let's continue this next time. We're going to talk about specific ideas concerning machining and in popular processes, particularly ones in use in our laboratory that you might be exposed to uh, during the practical. Thank you.